Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. Our topic today is orienting rehabilitation professionals to options in O&M. We are pleased to have a great panel of professionals with us today. I'm going to give just a few introductory comments and then we'll jump into our panel discussion. My name is Kendra Farrow and I am the project director for the Older Individuals Who Are Blind Technical Assistance and Training Center. Back in 2018, the OIB TAC published a list of best practices for providing services to older individuals with vision loss. And this is part of what we published in, those, in that best practice document. So we talked about the qualifications of staff and we feel and believe that the best practice is for individuals, for the professionals who provide services to hold a certification in the area in which they provide services. So whether that is in orientation and mobility, vision rehab therapy, low vision therapy, um, assistive technology instruction, whatever those areas are, that it's a best practice that if a professional is working in those areas that they have the professional qualifications and certification to work in those areas. We also believe that it's best for them to practice within their scope of practice. And if they're not certified, that they work under a certified professional and work toward their certification. So looking at the types of certification for orientation and mobility, and you will see both of these represented in our panel today. So from the Academy for Certification of Vision Rehabilitation Professionals, we have the COMS, um, which is a Certified Orientation and Mobility Specialist. From the National Blindness Professional Certification Board, we have an NBPCB, um, or MBPCB. We have the NOMC, which stands for National Orientation and Mobility Certification. So I'm going to briefly just describe the scope of practice for an orientation mobility professional, and this is by no means comprehensive. They provide instruction to individuals who have limited vision that helps them to be able to orient themselves in space and to travel safely throughout the areas where they want to or need to be able to travel. It can include such things as use of a long cane, human guide, and the use of all their senses to do those travel activities. So how do O&M professionals become qualified to provide services? They complete coursework at a university program, they complete an extensive internship, and they pass a certification exam. They also have to recertify every five years. We recognize that there are many uh, shortages of orientation mobility specialists across the country. This is not um, uh, isolated to one particular area of, of the country. So here are some suggestions. Um, first of all, to grow your own. And if you're interested in how to um, do this, one option is to look at our July webinar strategies for recruiting on college campuses where our very own Lisa Gooden Hunley, who came from our career services office here at Mississippi State, she uh, describes how to go through the career services office um, at any campus and be able to talk to classes and participate in job fairs to talk to students about the field of orientation and mobility or any of the other blindness professionals. You can also refer your clients to um, some free orientation and mobility services available through two guide dog schools. And uh, we have a handout on the website that you can download to see the particulars about that, but this is free of charge, including the travel costs um, to go to the dog guide school and receive 
training from um, an orientation mobility professional. You also might consider filling in with some short term contracts, and I don't know how popular this is, but I know of at least one O&M specialist who is um, signing contracts to work short term in certain areas to try to um, really help with the, the shortage and just going to that region and working there for a short, intense period of time with several individuals who really need services. So there are some creative things that are starting to happen, and I think we um, need to keep the conversation moving forward. But all that said, I'd like to move forward with our panel discussion today. Okay. Welcome everyone. Uh, we have a great panel today. We have um, three professionals who work in the field of orientation and mobility. I'm going to give them each a chance to introduce themselves and tell us just a little bit um, about who they work for and how many years they've been in the field. Uh, let's start with you, Deja. Hey everyone, my name is Deja Powell. I currently reside in Seattle, Washington. I am currently the Youth Services Coordinator for Pre-Employment Transition Services for the state of Washington. I've also been a certified NOMC, which is a National Orientation and Mobility Certified Cane Travel Instructor for about 14 years now. And um, I have gone through a variety of different um, a teaching uh, mechanisms such as teaching youth, teaching adults, teaching seniors, um, just a wide vari variety of different services that I've been able to provide over the years and just continue my work in the in the blindness field. Well, Brad? Sure, hi, I'm Brad Blair. I live and work in Charlotte, North Carolina. I am in no particular order, a certified orientation and mobility specialist, COMS, certified assistive technology instructional specialist, CADIS, and a certified vision rehabilitation therapist, CBRT. I work for the Metrolina Association for the Blind, which is a nonprofit agency serving people who are blind or visually impaired in the greater Charlotte metro area. And my clients are mainly adults and senior citizens with varying degrees of vision loss and blindness. Rachel? Hi, I'm Rachel Caleri. I graduated oh, from uh, Northern Illinois University in 2007 and moved to Spokane, Washington in 2010 uh, to work for an agency serving older adults. I recently uh, went out on my own to start um, to do orientation mobility instruction independently and also to focus more on um, accessibility, um, accessible infrastructure, um, advocating and consulting for accessible infrastructure. I'm also an adjunct professor with Portland State University, and I'm currently the chair of the AER o &M division. Thank you. Our next question is, how did you learn about the field of orientation and mobility? And uh, let's start with, uh, Brad on this one. I learned about o &M from earliest childhood. I was receiving services in Central Texas at the time. And I, as soon as I entered school, I had o &M instructors and by and large, they were very good ones. So uh, I have always known about o &M and uh, a shout out to Rachel. I guess we are both NIU alums, by the way. Go Huskies. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Rachel, how did you learn about O&M? Um, I had the opposite knowledge of O&M, having no knowledge of its existence until well into my 30s. Um, I knew, though, from an early age that blindness did not need to be a barrier to independence because of a woman who came and spoke to my second grade class and showed us how she lived her life as a person with vision loss. And so I knew that it was just uh, a fact of life that people with vision loss use non-visual techniques to do things. Um, but it never occurred to me that there was any sort of instruction or curriculum that went to this 
until much later on um, when I saw a TV show called Starting Over where there was a woman who had albinism and wanted to go to college. And I learned through observing her O&M instruction that there is a curriculum, that there are teachers, that there is a process uh, where a person learns to use non-visual techniques successfully. So I was able to put those two things together at that time. <laughs> Adesha. My, my story of connecting with O&M is kind of an interesting one because I am blind myself and have been blind since birth, but I, have, I had never heard of an orientation and mobility specialist until I was probably in my late middle school years. Um, I never received any services, was never given a cane or instructed in Braille or anything. Um, and when I was about to enter high school, my mom was approached by um, a Braille, t a TVI, a, a Braille teacher and an O&M instructor and said, you know, maybe it'd be a good idea for your daughter to have some services. And that's the first time I ever heard of an orientation and mobility instructor, but never in my wildest mind did I ever think that was something I would be interested in. And so I actually graduated college, got a degree in journalism, um, was having troubles getting a job, and so decided to go to an orientation and training center to receive training for myself. And um, I ended up going to Louisiana and getting that training. And during that process, um, cane travel was by far my most challenging class and also the, the class where I grew the most. And um, my actually, actually my orientation and mobility instructor is the one that, that basically convinced me to, to go into the field. And so that's sort of how I was introduced to O&M and how I ended up you know, becoming an orientation and mobility instructor. Thank you. Um, so Rachel, what made you want to join the field? Well, as I said before, I knew that vision loss didn't need to be a barrier to independence. And when I became an adult and realized that societally blindness can be a barrier to independence, I knew that this did not need to be the case. And so I got into the field as quickly as possible um, to to do my part <laughs> to rectify that. All right, Deja. Yeah, and I kind of, I started diving into this a little bit in my previous answer, but um, for me, it was a very personal choice and a very personal experience for me because I saw such um, tremendous growth in my confidence and my independence through my own cane travel instruction as an adult. And as I watched that process and I watched my peers at the training center go through that process, I just thought to myself, you know, like what other career in the world, you know, totally transforms a person's life the way this, this has transformed mine. And so that just seems like a really cool career. I was also, um, you know, not a big fan of sitting behind a desk all day or behind a computer all day. And so um, O&M gives you that outlet to kind of get out and no day is the same as a cane travel instructor. And so there were lots of things that kind of drew me to the field that I was interested in. But like I said before, uh, I had no, no intention of ever going into the blindness field whatsoever, let alone being an O&M instructor. So it, it was a big, it was a big transformation for me. Uh, Brad. As a blind person, when I was younger, I, I would have said, and I did say, that I didn't want to go into blindness rehab or blindness education, whatever you want to call it, because there needed to be blind people doing everything, not just teaching blind people. And so I was going through my graduate studies in German because I wanted to be a college professor. Well, long story short, that didn't work out. And so when I was in my mid thirties, I looked around and I realized that I was still a teacher, even if the subject matter wasn't gonna be German grammar. And you know, what, what did I have to offer? And then I realized that I knew a lot of blind folks 
with high degrees of travel anxiety, either because they had not learned certain travel skills properly, or they had once learned them and then forgotten them as adults. So I decided in my mid thirties to go back to school, to go into blindness rehab. And I decided that if I was going to do it, uh, me being the silly person that I am, I was going to choose the most difficult path possible and become a certified O&M specialist. Uh, and long story short, I did. And it's a lot of fun. And Deja is absolutely right. No two days are the same. And the day that I think I'm going to have is sometimes not the day I end up having. So it is a lot of fun. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Deja, we'll start with you on this one. Um, describe your O&M professional preparation program. Yeah, this is a great question. Um, this is um, something that I always get excited to talk about because I loved, I loved the process of becoming uh, an NOMC and getting my certification at a university. I absolutely, absolutely loved my master's degree experience a lot more than my undergrad experience, I have to say. And so I do get really excited because I think when you're working on a master's degree in something that you're passionate about, it's it's really fun because you're actually taking classes you're interested in. And so my experience was at Louisiana Tech University and um, I went through the went through the regular academic rigor of you know getting a master's degree. But on top of that, we did a lot of additional, um, very much hands-on, very much um, direct learning experiences. I uh, did over a thousand hours under sleep shades, um, under training shades, whatever we're calling them these days, I get confused under training shades and, um, really felt like that experience pushed me over the top. As far as being a teacher, I really felt confident in my ability to teach with the vision that I do have based on the non-visual experience I had in the program. So I had lots of, lots of training hours. Some of that was observation of other instructors, some blind, some sighted. Um, some of that was apprenticeship hours, you know, having support from staff as you go through the training. I did an entire summer of internship, like I know most o &M instructors do, and that was really fun, really, really hot and sweaty in um, the summer in Louisiana, but you know, you get through it and uh, I was going through, you know, four or five pairs of training shades a day because mine would be soaked in sweat after each class. So that's one of my fond memories of that experience. Um, but it was a it was a great opportunity for me to get that teaching experience that um, I desperately needed, you know, and I got to work with students at a local training center near Louisiana Tech. So I worked with blind students, blind adults who were actually going through their own training program, which was a really great opportunity. We did lots of, you know, like crowd travel, we're gonna go to Mardi Gras, you know, big city travel, we're going to New York City, you know, like um, just really in-depth training. I felt more secure than ever upon my graduation and felt more ready than I ever thought I could um, to be a teacher. And I felt really confident in my travel skills through my program. So I'm really thankful for that part of my journey. and. Um, the certification exam was really challenging for me, but I did go through that certification exam and got my, got my NOMC certification and it was a great process for me. That's a great experience. <laughs> um, Rachel. Uh, well, I was glad to attend a, an in-person program. I think distance programs are great. I'm glad that we have more of them. We're able to reach a lot more people. Um, but I really enjoyed being in the classroom with my cohort every day. And um, I felt like we got a lot out of that. So I did my internship at, an, at a uh, training center for adults in Chicago. And it really, uh, it really brought home the experience of how a center can be so wonderful, such a variety of classes that a person can attend every day. You can work on skills every day. But when 
when the environment was so different than people who were, for example, from uh, rural Southern Illinois, it was so difficult to find training areas that were relevant to them. Mm -hmm. So it really was such a great illustration of why the itinerant and center instructors needed to work together for a person to receive the training that they need. Thank you. Rachel, did you, did you intern at uh, Icree Wood? Yes, sir. <laughs> you as well? No, ma'am. No. Uh, the um, Lighthouse? No, ma'am. Somewhere else. All right. <laughs> I'll give you one more guess. <laughs> Why don't you just tell us? Since it's I your will. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, I actually kept a journal of my experience becoming a mobility instructor um, from the time I took the cane courses until the day I certified because I loved it and I never wanted to forget what I did and what I saw. So to condense this from the many pages that it is into a short answer, I will say that uh, I also went through Rachel's program at NIU. Uh, were you there when Bill Penrod was there? No, unfortunately, it was just before. Yeah, so I was the first totally blind O&M candidate through our program. Mm. Um, there's a lot I could say about that. One thing I will say is the fact that other comms programs have had blind candidates didn't help us one little bit. We had to reinvent the wheel. Mm. Um, didn't help us at all. I never met a blind o &M specialist of any stripe face to face until I had been certified for over a year. In fact, it was at the AER conference that I finally met one. Um, so, and to talk to uh, Deja a bit, we, you know, I also uh, loved the master's program. I did not learn about the I did not know what an NOMC was when I went to grad school. I did not know that this uh, that this being existed, and I did not. I had never heard of structured discovery, or what it was. Um, I can honestly say, now that I am quite familiar with structured discovery, as a as a nod to my NOMC friends, I can say that many of my methods resemble structured discovery, and I was often taught using what we would now call structured discovery. Uh, when I was in school. So I, I can say that now. But uh, I went through the standard issue master's program. My biggest disadvantage, no, let me start with advantage. My biggest advantage over my classmates was that I didn't need to be taught the methods. They had to be taught the skills and taught how to teach them. And uh, it was tough for them. Uh, I didn't need to be taught the methods. But most of what they had to say about how to teach the skills I had to adapt. So I felt like I was inventing the wheel all over again as I went through. And I, again, I did not have access to very many uh, blind O&Ms. Uh, I think I had a few phone conversations with a couple of NOMCs and for the most part, I was having to figure it out. Um, which I did. I mean, nobody died, right? And nobody even got hurt. Um, went through an internship at Second Sense in Chicago. Do you know that one, Rachel? Oh, you know? yeah. Yeah, you know Second Sense? Oh, yeah. Okay, so that was where I was. And th that was during the second big wave of COVID. So fall of 20 through spring of 21. My internship actually lasted for nine months because there was a break thanks to COVID shutting things down. And then in the spring semester, I was interning at Heinz VA doing my technology. And at night I was interning as an O&M. So there were plenty of evenings when I would jump in an Uber and race off to you know 20 miles across Chicago to teach a lesson and uh, you know, for, as, as the O&M intern. So wearing those hats and that was that was very grueling and I wouldn't trade it for anything because it gave me a ton of unique stories and and Rachel when we're not recording I will have to tell you about my own efforts to teach a rural lesson in Chicago so that we could check that box. 
Yep. <laughs> it's not easy. All right, here's a fun question. We'll start with Rachel. Um, what do you like about working in the field of orientation and mobility? You know, just quite simply, I like being able to work collaboratively with an individual on their goals. Um, that's really in a nutshell what I like about it, helping a person identify what they want to be able to do and helping them figure out how they're going to get there. That's, <laughs> that's the entirety of it. In a nutshell. Yep. <laughs> All right, um, Brad. I like the wide variety of experiences. You know, I like the kind of day where I could be talking to a 78 year old, you know, in the morning who is losing their vision and they're feeling hopeless because they feel stuck in their home. And then maybe it turns out that they live outside of transportation coverage. So there's some truth to that. So we're having that conversation and why should I carry a cane? And then in the afternoon, I'm teaching a hiking lesson at the Whitewater Rafting Center. I mean, you just, you never know. And then somebody cancels. So then you have to figure out what to do with your morning and the next day. So it's, it's a huge, wide variety of just everything, every skill level. Um, and I enjoy the beginning lessons as much as the six hour public transit lessons. So it's, it's so much fun. I, I second that. Yes, the introductory lessons are often just as wonderful. Mm -hmm. Deja. Yeah, this um, hearing hearing from the two of you may, made me miss like just straight up teaching, uh, being an O&M teacher. Um, I'm doing a lot more, you know, managerial and administrative stuff now. And I, I miss those, <laughs> those days of, um, you know, the eclectic group of um, students that I would get to teach. But the reason I love orientation and mobility so much, and I've mentioned it before, is that it's a job that never gets boring. That's for sure. Um, there's always something different to do. There's always a new thing to learn. Um, it's kind of hard to wrap up O&M instruction because you always feel like as an instructor, there's more I could give them. There's more I could do. But eventually you have to kind of let them go. And that's the other part of the job that is so empowering and wonderful is seeing the transformation of the students and that you are working with you know seeing them going from being nervous to walk out their front door to seeing them you know whatever their goal is to meet that goal whether it's taking a bus a city bus or you know um I you, just having those experiences where you get to see them reach a goal or a milestone in their life, it's just, a, it's an unreal experience. And I know of very few fields in the world where you kind of get that huge um, confidence, independence, uh, you get to actually see that progress in somebody. And it's, it's such a fun reason to be an O&M instructor. And so there, there's so many reasons. I could list a million reasons, but I won't right now. But those are just a couple of my favorites. Thank you. Were you going to say something else, Brett? No, just saying, love it. Love it. Yeah. All right. Um, so here is my favorite question of our panel. When talking to clients who are resistant to wanting to learn to use a white cane, how do you talk to them? or convince them about the services you provide. Uh, we're gonna start with Brad on this one. That's a fun question. So because of my agency structure and the way clients appear on my wait list, if I'm seeing them at all, it is because they have somehow indicated some kind of interest in O&M skills, even if they have no idea what O&M is. So there's a tiny bit of who are you and what, what are you about? So, you know, that gives me my lead in, but I have definitely run into this. And, you know, unlike say the Colorado Center for the Blind or what have you, I can't compel 
sleep shade training, although sometimes I really wish I could. I mean, there, there are, anyway, don't get me started on sleep shade training because I really enjoy it and I love it when clients ask for it. But anyway, most of my clients who are resistant to the cane, we approach it from two angles. First of all, don't you want to stop walking off of curbs? Don't you actually, don't you want to be able to find those stairs without being afraid? So we appeal to that self-interest because a lot of times that's one thing they're having trouble with. Second of all, we talk about how the cane can serve as a signifier to the fully sighted public that you even if you appear to move and to gaze and to look uh, like a sighted person, you might have a visual impairment. And I always ask them this question, how often are you at the store when you've run into this? Hey, can you tell me where this and such is? And the person replies, it's over there. What are you, can't you see? And the client's like, yeah, I, you know, I, I have run into that. I'm like, yeah, this is how we put the brakes on that. Um, and this is how we put the brakes on having to go everywhere with your spouse, because I, I hear that a lot. So we talk about those, those two points, and somewhere in there, there's usually a buy-in of, okay, maybe it would be good if I at least carried my cane. If I can get them to do that much, that is uh, a small win. That's a start. Uh, Deja. Yeah, this is a really fun question for me because I was that person uh, for the majority of my life who didn't want to use a cane, who was embarrassed to use a cane, who didn't think I was blind enough to use a cane. I mean, the list of reasons why I wasn't, the excuses, I guess I should say, to why I wasn't using a cane was rather extensive. So when I hear my my students, you know, talk about their their struggles with wanting to use the cane. Um, a lot of times I can relate because I have very, I had very similar feelings my whole life. And so there's a, there's a chance there for kind of a personal connection to say, oh yeah, I totally get it. Like I was embarrassed too. And you know, this happened and this happened, sharing those experiences is great. But even in talking, you know, when I was very first getting my own O&M training, my, my instructor, he was an NOMC, but he was cited. And um, he, I was having a really hard time using my cane, even when I went to training. And he um, connected me with other blind people um, around the community that he saw that were kind of similar to my personality or we had similar interests or had gone through the same struggles with using a cane as me. And those connections were vital to me realizing, you know, um, in real life experiences, how other people benefited from using the cane. And so I'm always a really big advocate of the mentoring and the role modeling structure of things of, you know, connecting them with other people that might be able to sympathize and empathize with them about their struggles with using a cane, you know, and there, there's so many other, other tactics that, you know, you can implement, but for me, that's a big one. For me, that's a big one. Connecting them with someone that understands what they're going through is so vital and essential to at least planting that seed for them to use a cane. Thank you. Uh, Rachel. Um, yeah, this is a really interesting topic, I think, because um, Anyway, in my career where I was at the center, you know, as Brad had said, people are there for O&M. But then when I went to work for an agency serving older adults, people were there for magnification. They really weren't there for O&M. They just demonstrated a need for it. So there really was a lot of need for encouragement. And a lot of um, something I hear frequently is uh, what Brad and Deja were both saying about people not thinking that they are blind enough to use a cane people not wanting to appear fraudulent um, in the community. Um, and also people just feeling as though this, this isn't a tool for me. I would feel bad to, you know, our society frowns upon uh, pretending a person has a disability. And so people don't want to do that. So first of all, talking about who is an appropriate cane user, it's okay for you to use this tool. This will help and identifying, I'm sorry, I'm going to get excited about this topic helping a person identify when and how a cane will be helpful for them. 
it might not be that a person who is uh, a person may have challenges and low light conditions and that may be at the moment the only time that they really need a cane or the time that they would benefit most from it so to identify those times and those places where a person would benefit from using a cane could open the door to that um, i had a client that was not going to the lake house with her family anymore because of stairs going down to the lake and because of the stairs going down to the lake, she had given up the activity entirely of going to the lake with her family. Um, but by using the cane just for this one activity, she was able to be part of this family outing. And so by helping a person determine when and how a cane would be useful for them can make a person a collaborative part of that process. I personally think that if you're talking about competent adults, that the cane doesn't have to be white. If you can talk to a person about how, you know, from what you're describing, I think that you would enjoy the information that you would get from a previewing type cane. Um, cane would not have to be white if you don't want to, but it usually is. People usually choose white and can talk about why. Um, but to present it as an option for the person, that allows the person to choose it for themselves and to understand that, well, if I was going somewhere where the cane is a tool for the user, and if they didn't need or want to be identified, then why not a cane that is colored in a person's hand rather than a white one left back at home? Um, so talking with a person about all of the options available to them, um, I think is helpful. Dealing with modifications, if a different technique helps a person to be able to move a cane more easily, um, then you might get more chances of success and more interest in, in using the cane. So those are a couple of places where I would start with a person. I'll shush can, now. <laughs> can I add something? That Absolutely. Want? So I uh, have to admit that I get the, well, two things. One is a comment to Deja. I, I feel like you have a distinct advantage over me in this, this, in this discussion with the clients because you have actually been there. You've gone through the vision loss journey. So you really have that uh, connectivity. You know, I, I can't relate to that because I've only ever been blind. So I have to be mm -hmm. careful when I'm talking because to me, I mean, I never had the option of trying to do without a cane. It would have been a very mm -hmm. dangerous, foolish thing to do. So right. I have to watch my P's and Q's. Um, to Rachel, uh, <laughs> the darker side of what you said is I, I don't have a lot of experience with the, oh man, I just don't want to appear fraudulent. I have a lot more experience with the but if I carry a cane, everybody's going to actually know that I'm blind. And I'm just glad that I, I don't have as little vision as you do. Side mm -hmm. of it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So this is Kendra and I know I'm not an orientation mobility instructor, but I have had various levels of limited vision throughout my life. And so the things I would say to, to my consumers when they were on that, that line was, um, you know, if people are going to think something about them, about you because of, of your mobility, whether you're using a white cane or not using a cane, a long cane at all, um, what are they going to see, think about you if they see you bumping into walls? Mm -hmm. Are they going to think that maybe you're drunk? <laughs> mm -hmm. Would you rather people have that opinion of you than think, or, or just that you're not really with it, that you have dementia because you didn't recognize them. You know, if you identify yourself as blind and they know why you're not saying hello to them from across the lunchroom or the area that you're traveling through in the store when you're passing them, you know, wouldn't it be better for them to know the truth than to think something else that is even less attractive? I have a client right now whose children, according to her, she's in her 60s, her children actually thought she was going senile and weren't getting the fact that she was not going senile, but going blind. So yeah, that's, that's what I thought of when you said that. Because, I mean, you can't see to read things. Mm -hmm. And so you might shy away from the reading of, of things out loud and 
or pick up the wrong thing that you thought was something else, mm. you know, you can't interact in the same way. It can present exactly as dementia for someone older if, if the family really doesn't know or the friends don't know. And so in that way, it is so, it's so beneficial to identify yourself. And I just, anyway, <laughs> I appreciate this discussion because I think it's so important to, to have those conversations with the individuals that, that we serve to make sure that they um, reach out for the services that could really benefit them. Cause so many times they, they just refuse. And then, you know, it's, it's really, a detriment to them and and we do actually have statistics that tell us that people older people who have vision loss are about twice as likely to fall as people who don't have vision loss in the same age group so i i really um just love these kinds of conversations and i, I love even when i can convince someone to get that o m referral even though i can't provide the o m services it's, it's great any closing comments or thoughts from any of you well, you're reminding me, Kendra, this is Rachel, if you don't mind, that yes, fall prevention is one of those big points when I say to talk a, a, to a person about how a cane will benefit them. Um, fall prevention, to talk to a person about what would it take to recover from a fall versus what would it take to use this preview tool, um, that can be helpful to a person as well. And the idea of building rapport ahead of time, taking the time to build the rapport yeah. and to teach the protective skills, the guiding techniques, the things that will make a difference for the person's immediate, um, you know, the immediate and practical skills that the person needs, that can really open the door to trying a long cane when it is suggested to them because this instructor has shown that they care and has shown that they have the ability to teach things that are actually useful. So Thank you. the one thing I would add to that when it comes to fall prevention is the whole, uh, Rachel and Deja, you probably know about this debate, the whole support cane debate, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I was confronted with this recently and I decided not to issue a support cane because I do not feel competent to actually give the instruction in the use of it. I mean, that's a physical therapist's job. I'm not a PT. Uh, and, and But there's that whole debate in our field. Should we be issuing support canes to prevent falls? My answer is no, because we lack the training. But yeah, that's, that's where my mind was going with that. It's a, it's a tough call between issuing a support cane to someone who doesn't already have one or teaching someone who uses a support cane to incorporate a long cane into the use of that. And, and this you know, was an entirely different kind of. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. And this was someone who did not already have yeah. one. Yeah, that's pretty dicey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all for a great conversation and we will look forward to our live conversation following this presentation.